so that we can all make the most of our evening. So as other folk join, they will get to uh, enjoy our talk tonight. I'm Beth Hessel, the Executive Director of the Athenaeum. As most of you know, if this is your first time joining us, we are a Philadelphia-centered and member-supported circulating library, research institution, and community forum. Uh, we are a lively group of people that enjoy having wonderful conversations about art and history, literature and architecture and the built environment um, and, and in person when we're able to and for now in our virtual speaker series. Tonight, um, I want to remind you before I introduce our speaker for your best experience, if you're on a laptop, if you're on a phone, it, it's going to be a different experience or an iPad. But you should see in your upper right hand corner a little icon that says either speaker view or gallery view. If you click on that, you should get to the point where you only see the person who is speaking uh, and that will give you the best experience. So when when Will Noel starts speaking, you won't see me or Tess Galen, but only Will and his slides, which are on the screen right now. Also at the bottom, uh, you will find a Q&A and a chat icon. If you have questions, you can type them in anytime during his talk and we'll uh, get to them during our Q&A period. Please put them, uh, I prefer you to put them in the Q&A section, but if you feel most comfortable using chat, you can put them in chat and I will moderate those during that time. Will Noll is, is someone who is well known in the Philadelphia area and does not want a lot of hullabaloo over him in his introduction. So I just want to tell you, first off, I first got to know Will as the president of Pack School, which is a Philadelphia area consortium of special collection libraries of which the Athenaeum is a part. Um, I also got to know him when he was the head of, of special services, special collections at the uh, Penn Library. Uh, but since, was it February, I believe, February, March, uh, Will has been the Director of Special Collections at Princeton Library. And we are so delighted to have him come here to talk uh, tonight, a topic for which he, he wrote an award-winning book and did a TED Talk, which has had more than a million views. Um, so I think we're in for a treat. I want you all to invite, by, uh, join me, please, in virtually welcoming Will Noll uh, to the Athenaeum Virtual Speaker Series. Thank you for being here, Will. Beth, thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, it's great to be speaking to a Philadelphia audience, which is probably scattered to the winds. One of the things about a virtual environment is it's hard to picture where, where I am. Actually, I'm at the dining table of the Duke of Berry because behind me is the, is the illustration of January uh, from the Trey Riche, uh, which is actually it, it, the, the uh, Musée Condé in Chantilly, but but anyway, that's that's I I like to pretend that I'm feasting in January, but actually I'm speaking to you from uh, Chestnut Hill in Philadelphia, which is which is where I live, and um, and uh, it's great to be it's great to be with you tonight. Thank you so much for the invitation. So I'm starting off with a picture of a man and a book. Uh, the man on the left is is Archimedes, who. Uh, was killed uh, in 212 BC in Syracuse in Sicily, which was part of Magna Graeca. And uh, it was a city state and it had made some political, politically bad decisions and, and, and Archimedes was killed in the siege of the city by the Romans. Um, he's, a, he's a figure of legend. Uh, the legends may partially be true, but we will never know. What's really amazing about the man is his mathematical treaties, um, which are of astonishing brilliance. I mean, they really are kind of wonderful. And, um, and, and Archimedes, as he was writing, he was a real person and he had a real character. He liked to sort of demonstrate mathematical truths and, and, and he would write deliberately fake ones. And so other mathematicians in the Mediterranean area would, would say, oh, I could have done what Archimedes had did. And then Archimedes would, would write another role and he would say, oh, but you know, that stupid mathematician Dolan, he, he misunderstood what I said and it was a quite deliberate cheat on my part. So he was a mischievous person uh, and, and a really brilliant person. And because he was brilliant, and he was a mathematician, very few people understood him. And because he wasn't very well understood, 
he wasn't much read. And because he wasn't much read, he wasn't copied very much. And this is a recipe for total disaster. Uh, because if you are an ancient writer, the only way that you get to be known about today is, is because medieval scribes read you and copied you. Archimedes wasn't copied very often. Uh, so everything we know about Archimedes, we know about from just three books, and rather boringly for my story, they're called Codices A, B, and C. Um, and we have about 10 treaties by Archimedes, 10 to 14, depends on how you count them and which ones are genuine. Um, Codex A uh, was last heard of in the library of an Italian humanist called Rodolfo Pio of Carpi in 1564, and he seems to have lost it. And Codex B was last heard of in one of the Pope's libraries in Viterbo, about 100 miles north of Rome in 1311. And he too seems to have mislaid it. Those two books did their job. Uh, they were copied. And so we still know what was in them because we know about that from later copies. But codices A and B, were how the world were the trans were how the world knew about Archimedes until 1906, and then in 1906 someone discovered Codex C, and that's Codex C on my on on the right there, and Archimedes Codex C uh, contained two texts that weren't in A and B, and the world didn't know about them. One's called the Method of Mechanical Theorems, and the other is called the Stomachium, uh, also by a quirk of textual transmission. Uh, Codex C is the only, is the only version that, uh, ha, how we know the Greek version of Archimedes' treatise on floating bodies. Now, now Codex C didn't do its work. It wasn't copied. And so people didn't know what was in it. And it wasn't copied uh, because it was written in the in the it was written in the um, in the 10th century in Constantinople. Uh, and so I show, show you a slide. Am I moving forward? Let's see. There you are. I'm moving forward this way anyway. I'm this is a this is this is a slide, as you all know, of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Um, and uh, funnily enough, Hagia Sophia was in part designed by Isidore of Miletus, who was important in the transformation in, in, in the transmission of Archimedes' texts. And I like to think of uh, Hagia Sophia as a mixture of spheres and cylinders, uh, which of course is something that Archimedes liked to play with too. Um, but, the, but this manuscript was copied in the 10th century and it was, um, it was, it lasted about 300 years before it was turned into a palimpsest. Now, what's a palimpsest? A palimpsest is a book that uh, is used, is, is, the parchment in this book is used to make another book. So, uh, a scribe wanted to make a prayer book and he couldn't find the parchment. And so he went to the Archimedes manuscript and he took it apart. He unstitched it, unbound it, and then he scraped off all the text on these sheets that look like they're, they're, they're sort of books are constructed like newspapers. Um, lots of newspapers stitched together. So they have they have double sides, as it were, conjoint sheets. And the scribe scraped off all the text on these sheets on all the Archimedes pages. And then he cut them down in the half and he stacked them in a corner. There wasn't enough, there wasn't enough um, parchment in the Archimedes book to, to make or the choir book that he wanted to make. So he used seven other books as well. He scraped off all the texts of those two. He scrapped them in the corner. These, he, he stacked them in the corner. And these books, the texts on these books are essentially gone. 
So he picks up these sheets after he's cut them in half, he rotates them 90 degrees, and he writes his new text on top at 90 degrees to the old text. And the old text is therefore buried under the new text. It doesn't follow in anything like the same order. Text disappears into the gutter. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's been pretty, it's been scraped off. The only question is how thoroughly. Uh, so well, let's see if we can find out how thoroughly. Here is a picture of the Archimedes palimpsest as it was in about 1998. And what you're looking at is a prayer book. Um, but can you see my cursor? Or not? No. Okay. But the Archimedes text is underneath the prayer book text, running at 90 degrees, and you might be able to see bits of it, particularly in the gutter. Uh, so you could just make out traces of it. It's extremely difficult to read. You can't really read it. Um, but there it is. And the book survived as a prayer book, not as an Archimedes text, but it survived as a prayer book. And it was used as a prayer book. And, uh, and in fact, being palimpsested is, 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 is a rather useful fate for a text, as long as you get rediscovered, because you get reused in a, in, in a religious context. And the context in which the Archimedes manuscript was reused after it was turned into a palimpsest uh, was in this monastery, uh, it's the Monastery of St. Sabas. It's about eight miles east of uh, Bethlehem in the Judean desert. And, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been a continuously running monastery since the fourth century AD. And uh, the manuscript was uh, kept in the tower in the center of that building. And when I went to on my pilgrimage to St. Sabas to see where the Archimedes palimpsest had been. Uh, I was met by the only monk who admitted to um, speaking in English. His name was um, Brother Lazarus. Uh, he was a hippie from San Francisco, but he found peace in the monastery of St. Sabas. Uh, he only missed the Grateful Dead, um, but he was reminded of the Grateful Dead by something called a Samantron, which is a regularly ringing ringing bar that by which he went to breakfast and he showed me around the place it was rather wonderful it's very very beautiful um it stayed there until the 19th century when it ended up in in uh the metokion of the holy sepulcher in constantinople back where it had been made in the first place and um and uh we know that it was there to cut a long story short, because the manuscripts in this library, which belonged to the Greek Patriarch of Jerusalem, were catalogued. They were catalogued in 1899 by a man called Athanasius Papadopoulos Kerameus. So I'm going to call him PK. PK catalogued all the manuscripts in this library. And, uh, and he made rather detailed catalog entries because he was um, he didn't have tenure and he was paid by the page for his paid by, paid by the page for his work. So he wrote really detailed catalog entries. And when he came up to manuscript 355, which is the Archimedes palimpsest, as well as telling you what was on the overtext, he could read two lines of the undertext, just two lines, and he typed them out. And this catalog, which was published in 1899, came came into the hands of one of the great heroes of this story. Professor of Philology at Copenhagen, a man called Johann Ludwig Heiberg. He was exactly the right man to receive this catalogue, this eye of the library in, in the Metokion, um, because he'd just done the complete works of Archimedes. He just edited the complete works of Archimedes. And he read those two lines and he said, I know who wrote those two lines. Archimedes wrote those two lines. This is from the sphere and the cylinder. And then he thought, well, if if this is truly an archimedes manuscript and if the catalog is right this archimedes manuscript is 400 years earlier than any archimedes manuscript i've ever seen so i'd better go and see this manuscript now heiberg was professor of philology at copenhagen he did have tenure so he wrote to the monks and said please send me the book and the monk said no so in his summer vac he went to the monastery in 
Copenhagen, in, in Istanbul. And he found something that truly blew his mind. He found two foundational texts by the father of Western physics that had never been read before. And we have his correspondence to his friend um, about, about how amazing it was to discover these two new treaties in this, in this book. He could, he could only stay there for a few weeks, and so he had photographs taken. Uh, these are the photographs that he had taken. And when we started work on this project, the photographs were lost, but we tracked them down. And you can see that um, you can see the prayer book text, and you might be able to see some of the Archimedes text in there, but it's uh, it's very very hard to read. And on the basis of his work, uh, he had to do all his work again. He had to do a completely new edition of the works of Archimedes, which was published by Teubner between 1910 and 1915, and. So Archimedes, Codex, Codex C had ostensibly done its work. It had been absorbed by Heiberg into the textual tradition and the modern text of Archimedes incorporates Codex C in it. Codex C, such is the fate of books. So it got very famous on July the 16th, 1906, big literary find. A savant discovers books by Archimedes copied around the year 900, and you'd have thought then that a medieval manuscript containing the unique text, the unique place that contains the, the thoughts of a very great man would be safe, but that doesn't happen to books. Books, The fate of books is not so clear. So uh, what happened in this case is that the Ottoman Empire, the old man of Europe, uh, crumbled in the First World War, and Ataturk founded the modern state of Turkey, which was aggressively secular and aggressively nationalistic. So this wasn't a good time to be a Greek monk in Istanbul. So all they moved all the books in the library. They moved all the books from uh, the Metochion in the Holy Sepulchre under cover of darkness to the National Library of Athens. And they were all in the National Library of Athens by 1938, except the good ones. <laughs> the book, good ones sort of lost their way and made it onto the uh, made it onto the art market, uh, and a lot of them are now in America, uh, and uh, and a lot of a lot of a lot of Byzantine manuscripts in general from the in American collections come from an exodus of manuscripts uh, from from Greece and Turkey in the in the early twentieth century. Uh, and most of them are illuminated, but the Archimedes palimpsest um, wasn't illuminated. It was a great text. And um, it wasn't pretty. The reason I've actually got the tray Richer behind me is because it's very, very hard to make the Archimedes palimpsest pretty. That's, that's what it looks like. Um, this is a this is a folio we might see again. It's 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 the it's it's it's, it's, it's folio one hundred and five, and and on the right you see there's a sort of a the, the page isn't quite square um, because it's made of parchment and and that's the armpit of a goat, and that goat is it has a claim to be one of the most important goats in the history of mathematics. Um, it was grazing in the field outside in Constantinople. Someone chopped off its head and it skinned it. And then a scribe wrote Archimedes' method on its back. And on that page is Archimedes' method proposition 14, which we will come back to. But Heiberg couldn't read it. And it's on that page. And we will see that page again. So to, the book was in private owner, but in, in, in private hands until um, throughout the 20th century, very hard to get hold of. Um, but it was sold to a private collector in America uh, for $2 million. And, um, and no one knew who this private collector was, uh, but he did promise to make the book available for study. I found out who this private collector was. And so I, I got in touch with him and I lied to him three times. I said, uh, I can read your book. I can image your book and I can conserve your book. 
And he said, okay. And uh, in truth, I couldn't do any of those things, but I knew I could find the people who could do those things. I was a curator of manuscripts at the Walters Art Museum at the time. And the owner came to drop off the manuscript. And it was then that I really started to appreciate what, how, how much trouble I was actually in. So, uh, so the book suffered very, very badly in the 20th century. On the left of the screen there is, um, is a photograph that Heiberg had of the manuscript that was taken in 1906. And in the top right-hand corner of that left-hand photograph, you'll see M16. That's the 16th page of the method of mechanical theorems that Heiberg found in the book. And it's on its side because of course, Heiberg had to read it on its side. Now, the page on the right, the photograph on the right is the same page. It is the same page. It has a forgery painted on top of it that I know was painted after 1938 because it contains thalocyanine green, which was only commercially available in Germany from 1938. And I know, and I know what it was copied from. It was copied on a one-to-one -one scale from, uh, from a reproduction in a book that was of, 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 of illuminated manuscripts from the Bibliothèque Nationale that was published in 1928. So Heiberg was, Heiberg was a clever guy. He read the text as best he could. And the owner was sort of betting that I would be able to do better than Heiberg. But I didn't know how I was ever going to do that when I had to read through a, a, four gold brown forgeries like that. And two of them were on the introduction to the method of mechanical theorem, uh, uniquely found in this book. Here's another example. This is the this is what you here have here are is a photograph of on the left of Archimedes uh, of the of the Archimedes palimpsest containing the stomachium. It's the only place in the world where you can see the stomachium in the Archimedes palimpsest, and that photograph was taken in 1906. Uh, the photograph on the, the image on the right is of the book taken in around the year 2000 same page. And as you can see, the book has suffered very badly from mold. Uh, and I'm going to show you some pretty cool imaging techniques, but I'm never going to be able to, to reproduce that, which is, which is no longer there. Uh, the, all the purple stuff is mold and the mold actually eats through the parchment. So this book was, this book was actually in very, very bad condition when, when it was bought by the owner to me. It's the definition of a write-off. Um, but he did bring it to me and I was at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore at the time and I and I put together a an integrated program of conservation imaging and research to see what we could do to save this book and to retrieve more Archimedes text than Heiberg could find. Now it was an integrated program of conservation imaging and research but I'm going to um, for the sake of time and simplicity, I'm going to talk about the program and then and then the conservation and then the imaging and then some of the results. So um, there's the book and here's the story. When when I got the book, we I got in touch with the Baltimore Sun and the Baltimore Sun produced a story on it, which got picked up by the Washington Post, and it got read by this guy who wrote to me and he said, Dear Dr. Noll, read with interest your article in the Washington Post. It certainly puts our work into perspective. We here at the National Reconnaissance Office have a variety of equipment that might be able to help. If you'd like to get in touch, please do so. If not, good luck with your endeavors. Yours sincerely, Michael B. Toth, National Policy Director, National Reconnaissance Office. Now, I thought that this was pretty cool. So I, um, I got in touch with him and actually, because it was a privately owned book, we couldn't use any of his equipment, but he volunteered as program manager for us as a sort of a weekend job, uh, which was fantastic because I didn't know anything about program management. 
and um, he taught me about cost schedule and performance. He taught me about management reserves and he built Gantt charts for me like that. And the way the the way the way the program ran was that he would manage it, and I would be the and I would be the public face both for him and for the owner, and I would, and I would and I would do the I would do the talking. And indeed, twenty three years later, I'm still doing the talking here to you now. Um, but Mike Toth uh, is one of the great unsung heroes of of the Archimedes project. Uh, so the conservation, the conservation was essentially all done by Abigail Quant, who was the conservator of manuscripts, still is the conservator of manuscripts at the Walters Art Museum, and a wonderful colleague and a great expert on parchment manuscripts and their conservation. Started out by doing a whole battery of tests, and we sent materials to the Canadian Conservation Institute, uh, where they have a wonderful lab. This is a tiny cross section of the Archimedes palimpsest. Uh, about the size of a pinhead. And uh, what you're seeing is the Arch is stain of the Archimedes text on the top. We drilled through, by the way, a diagram with a straight line. So we knew that we weren't, we could, we could reconstruct the bit that we were missing. And then we analyzed the parchment underneath. And, and the, the really, the really sad thing is that, you know, parchment is made of skin. It's made the stuff that it's made of the stuff your skin is made of. That is to say, it's made with of a lot of collagen, which is a protein. And it's this protein that keeps your skin both supple and strong. But in the Archimedes palimpsest, the protein in that parchment has broken down. And so this book is not like any normal parchment codex. It's actually much more like tissue paper. If you look at a detailed photo, it looks like that. Uh, what you're seeing is, is you know four lines of prayer book text. The Archimedes text you can't see, um, but but we have to try and read it, and we and we have to try not to damage damage parchment that is that is really that fragile. The main problem that Abigail had was actually on the spine of the book. Um, we had to take the book apart and read through the spine because the Archimedes text ran through the spine of the book, right? So you're now seeing the spine of the book as it was in 1998. And, um, and you can see that it sort of has two halves and the lower half is rather mucky and brown and that's, that's okay. Uh, a conservator can deal with that. It's hide glue, uh, which has been used, which used a lot to reinforce the structure of codices in the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries. It's nothing that's difficult. Now the white stuff on the top, that's that technically that's called a polyvinyl acetate emulsion with a high chalk content. Um, but to you and me, it's Elmer's wood glue. And Elmer's wood glue is tougher than the parchment that it sticks together. So it naturally took a long time to take the book apart. This is Abigail taking the book apart. I call this a rare action shot, but she doesn't like me when I do. Uh, it did take a long time to take the book apart. It took four years to take the book apart. And, uh, and you know, but as she did this, it slowly became apparent that um, we were dealing with a much more serious problem than, um, and a much more important problem than we, than, than we thought. So uh, this is page one. And what you're seeing there is, uh, is wormholes backlit. Now, wormholes don't actually like parchment. Uh, they, like the, they like the covers of the covers of parchment books, not the parchment itself, but they don't have a very good sense of direction. So they go into the parchment and then back out again. So the first few pages have holes in them. You're also seeing on the on the left hand side there, you're seeing stain from a, from a cover. And Heiberg didn't find anything on this book, but one of our scholars looked at it under ultraviolet light and he said, hey, I found two words from on floating bodies in the original Greek and Heiberg didn't find anything on this page. And it was then that we began to think, well, maybe Heiberg didn't know this book as well as, as well as people say. Um, and it sort of only increased the pressure on us. 
all Abigail was doing, in fact, was preparing the manuscript for imaging. She wasn't she, 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 she wasn't reinforcing it in any way. One of the things that she had to do was to carefully, carefully scrape off the wax that had been on the parchment codex because it had been used in the liturgical services of the Greek Orthodox Church. And this wasn't clean wax. This is very sort of dirty wax. So that's what she's doing there. Um, lots of little bits she would gather and she would organize them and put them in the right place. Uh, this is a photo micrograph of her working on the glue. Um, she finally managed to find a solution that would that, that enabled her to roll up the, the glue in little balls and, and, and slowly take the book apart that way. It was a mixture of isopropanol and water. Um, unbelievably time-consuming, laborious work. Um, just, just, you know. And then this is the box of bits, all the bits that she found, all the glue that she got, she put them and she arranged them in the order in which she found them. Now, most of, most of Abigail's work is not really visible because it uh, happens on a small scale, but Here's, here's, here's an example. She's dealing with one of the forged pages now and she's taking off a parchment strip that had been applied to it. And there you are, there's the parchment strip off that page, but it doesn't come from that page. It comes from that page. Um, there's a little tab that was put on the book because the forger was very proud of his work and he wanted you to see it. So he put a little tab on the page so that you could turn to it, but it, there it is. It, it actually comes from another part of the book. Now, some of these bits are really, really small, right? Uh, but they might have Archimedes text on them, so you don't throw them away. You preserve them. In fact, you image them, and yes, they do have Archimedes text on them. And you and you and you put them back in, and you put them, you put them back in, you put them back in the right place. Uh, this is an example of Abigail working on um, the gutter of the book. And you can see that the gutter has been crumpled and, and Abigail has got to uncrumple it. Um, she's got to uncrumple it before it can be imaged. So there she is performing brain surgery. And this, and on the, and you, you have the three in the row there. And the third one is a little JPEG in ultraviolet to bring out some of the text. Which we sent to our scholar in Stanford and he said, um, he circled it in Adobe Photoshop. He circled a circle in green. You see that little green circle? There's a circle inside it. And he says, this is the earliest symbol of a circle in the history of Western mathematical tradition. And you think, well, that's kind of cool. So you send it, you send the suite of images to the owner and the owner says, very excellent, go and do it again and here's some money. And actually the owner paid for the entire project. Uh, he paid for it year by year um, and the Archimedes project never suffered for lack of money. Uh, it didn't cost as much as you'd think because everybody volunteered. Um, and they weren't paid, they were professors or they were conservators or, you know, uh, it, um, and the owner of the palimpsest made it up to the institutions in ways that suited the institutions. And uh, I had a large hospitality budget and it all, it all worked. Um, and it worked for 14 years while the project went on. Um, the conservation was not done. But as, but as 14 leaves would become available, uh, we would start imaging them. And here is a leaf that Abigail has prepared for imaging. And now I'm going to talk a bit about the, the imaging. So the images, one of them was local. This is Bill Christens Barry. He worked at uh, the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University. He was, um, he did a lot of work on cancer, so he was very used to dealing with, with skin. Uh, this is Keith Knox, who at the time was working for the Xerox Corporation in Rochester, but then went to work 
for the US Army in Hawaii. And he was a, he's a famous imaging scientist who wrote something called the Knox Johnson algorithm that uh, helps you reconstitute images of stars that have been degraded by the lights been degraded by the atmosphere. Um, and this is uh, Roger Easton, who is in, uh, professor of imaging science at um, the Rochester Institute of, Techn of Technology. And they were always going to use a technique called multispectral imaging, uh, which sounds like wizardry. It's not wizardry. It's rather important that we all understand it's not wizardry. Um, here is the electromagnetic spectrum which runs all the way from radio waves to x-rays and gamma rays. There's a very small on the x-ray and the, and, and, and the radio waves are really, really long wavelength. And the x-rays are really, really short wavelength and therefore much more energetic. But in every other way, they're exactly the same. The thing is that um, human beings can only see, they can feel different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum as heat, but they can only see it through their eyes. They only see a very small part of it called the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It is about, if the bottom of the slide is 10 inches long, then the visible part, as you can probably see it, probably see it about, about, at about seven, six or seven inches along. Uh, and, uh, and cameras can see all the way along. They can see radio waves, they can see uh, X-rays, they can see visible light. We're going to now look at spectra of light that extend beyond the visible into the infrared and into the ultraviolet. The camera can see in these areas and then it can make what it sees apparent to the human eye. If you look at something with a different wavelength of light, you literally see different things. So this is the same text of the Archimedes palimpsest uh, seen through different wave bands. On the left, you see it in uh, ultraviolet, that is at a wavelength of light that is longer than the human eye can see. And you can see two texts. You can see the prayer book text going up and down and underneath it, you can see the Archimedes text. On the right there, you see, you, see, you see the same place, but in infrared light, which is in wave bands of light that are longer than the human eye can see. And there you can see the top text, but not the bottom text. Now, this is incredibly important. It's not that the ultraviolet text is the right answer. Multispectral images, they take different wave bands of light and they write algorithms or recipes to bring out what it is that you want. And I'm now going to show you roughly what, in, in very layman's terms, what they did. So here is an image of the Archimedes palimpsest in visible light on the left and in ultraviolet light on the right. And you can see that there are differences. You can see, for example, traces of a diagram in the, in the, in the, in the image on the right, that you that you can barely see at all in the image on the left. Okay. I am going to now merge these two images together. So I've got bright parchment in, in both cases, so it's going to come out bright. I've got dark prayer book in both cases, so it's going to come out dark. The prayer book text is running up and down, right? And then I've got a, a dark diagram on the right and a, and a light diagram on the left, as it were. And that's going to come out dark, but in a different color. It's actually going to come out red. And that's what it looks like. And then you can see that there's a color cue that helps you distinguish the text above that diagram. It helps you distinguish from the text above. And this color cue was incredibly useful for the scholars in, in reading the Archimedes text. Um, it's really, it was really, uh, it could work like magic, right? 80% of the time it could work like magic. 
of course, it's rather disappointing that you're seeing the undertext through the overtext. This turned out to be fine. If you're if you're if you read 19th century letters, you're entirely used to this. It's not a big problem. But 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 it's important to try and see the the, the scale and the breadth of the drawings because the drawings in this uh, in this manuscript are the unique source for the drawings that Archimedes drew in the sand in the third century BC. And you can't see that too very well at the end. So I'm gonna now process these same images in a different way. I'm gonna subtract one from the other. So if I subtract bright parchment on the left from bright parchment on the right, I'm gonna get zero. And if I subtract dark prayer book text on the left from dark prayer book text on the right, I'm gonna get zero. But if I subtract bright diagram on the left from dark diagram on the right, I'm going to get one. I'm going to get a diagram. And so that's what happens. So it's the same images used in both cases, just processed in different ways. And that's what a whole page looks like. And this is actually the uh, the end of the floating bodies are book, book one, where Archimedes is proving the various ways in which a, uh, a segment can float on, float on water. Uh, so we experimented, here's John Stokes, who set up our final imaging. We finally imaged the whole manuscript from start to finish in 14 different wave bands of light in, two, in 2007, using um, LEDs that had been developing uh, in technology through through the period. So that's how we did it. And you end up with images like this, uh, which are not pretty, but they work. And what you want to do is read them. And you don't read them like this. You zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in. And, and, and you, can, you can just read them. Uh, so this wasn't going to work with the, um, with the, um, Gold ground forgeries. Uh, I'm running out of time. I'll try and speed up. Um, this wasn't going to work with the gold ground forgeries. You were never going to get any light around the visible area to 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 penetrate the gold ground forgeries. It seemed like a hopeless case. Uh, but in 2004, we invited imagers on April Fool's Day actually to come and come and suggest possible. Uh, possible alternative ways of imaging. And they came up with several, uh, but the one I'm going to talk about is um, X-ray fluorescence imaging. And the imaging scientists here, one was Bob Morton from ConocoPhillips, Gene Hall, who was professor of chemistry at Rutgers, and Uwe Bergman on the right, who was staff scientist at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Both came up with the same idea, which is X-ray fluorescence imaging. How to describe X ray? So, so when you X rays have very high energy, they're very short wavelength. They have very high energy, and unlike uh, both, uh, electromagnetic rays in visible light, they don't play with the outer shell of the of an atom. They go into the inner shell of an atom, as sort of conceived of by Niels Bohr, and they knock off an electron from that inner shell. And as they do, they send out another X-ray and that X-ray comes out at a specific wavelength and the wavelength that it comes out at will be specific to the atomic arrangement of the ele electronic arrangement of the electrons around the nucleus. Now, if you can capture that X-ray that comes out, you can identify the atom, you can say, Okay, so that atom is manganese. So we took it to an X-ray machine and we found that we could identify the, 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 the metallic structure of what we were looking at. So there was a lot of iron because that's the iron gall ink. The ink was written in iron. And there was a lot of calcium because the calcium was part of the preparation process of the parchment. But the important point is the iron. We could detect the iron on the page. The thing is that we did not just have to detect the iron on the page. We then had to map the iron on the page. 
So we wanted to create an iron map of the page. And if we created an iron map of the page, then we could then we, then what we would be doing was effectively recreating where the text was on the page. And you can't do that in a small machine. You have to do that actually at a particle accelerator. So we went to the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory in California, uh, which has a synchrotron machine. And a synchrotron, cut a long story short, produces extremely powerful, it's an extremely powerful light source, concentrated and tunable. Uh, it can make x-rays so that you can examine uh, things at an atomic scale. And so we took Archimedes to that beam. We were on beam line 6-2. And you can't move the beam. So Archimedes had to go on an XY stage. And you can see the leaf on an XY stage there. The beam, the, 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 um, the X-ray comes out of that tube on the right. It bounces off and it's picked up by that detector on the left and it's mapped. And uh, this was incredibly exciting to try and do. And uh, we did it just about. Um, for those pages that we really needed, needed to do. And so that's what it looks like. Now, I'm not saying that these images are easy to read. In fact, they're incredibly difficult to read because the x-rays, you've now got four layers of text. And, and it's just really, really hard. And you have to be a nutcase to wanna, to wanna read this. But such nutcases do exist. You know, if the text is important enough, such nutcases do exist. They're called tenured faculty. And here is uh, Nigel Wilson of Lincoln College, Oxford, who was one of the people that transcribed the Archimedes text. And uh, here is Rebi L. Metz, who's professor of classics at Stanford. Together they transcribed the Archimedes. Um, and I'm just going to talk about some of the some of the things. So we started out when we, we it was a learning process. Our early images weren't very good. Here's an ultraviolet image, and this is of that by uh, that folio 105 that I was talking about, where the where the armpit of the goat was, right, or the armpit of the sheep. It's in the bottom right. You might be able to see it. And this is a page that that Ibo couldn't read, and Reviel Netz, our scholar, was very interested in it. So. Reviel here is writing in Adobe Photoshop what he thinks he can see uh, and what he's just guessing. And there's a little annotation in the margin where it says Q to, Q to AQ. Is tear possibly original? And there's a tear in the middle of the picture. And that's a question to Abigail Quant. Reviel is asking if the tear in the middle of the page is original, because if it is, then of course, there was never any text there. And, and Reviel doesn't have to try and make up the text. After we developed our pseudo color technique, uh, it got easier for Reviel. And then in 2001, I got this email. In a couple of months, the first intellectual fruits of our labor will be published together with a complete transcription of one crucial side of one page, most of which is unknown to modern science. I send you the final lines of the article as it stands in draft form. It is understated. It reads as follows. To sum up then, the new reading of Archimedes' Indivisibles proof should call for some reconsideration of the position of Archimedes in some key areas of the history of mathematics, especially the two related fields of the calculus and of infinity. Uh, this was pretty cool. Um, essentially, Reviel found that Archimedes was calculating with, with two sets of numbers. And he knew that in each number, there were there was as many as many things as you could have as you could possibly think of, um, and so he was saying essentially I'm dealing with two numbers and I don't can't tell you how many things are in each in each set, but I am telling you that they're the same, and that is and that is a that is a fundamental fundamentally far more advanced in, in our understanding of infinity than than we thought the Greeks could do. Uh, so he produced a learned article uh, together with his colleagues Ken Sato and Natalie Chernetska, uh, not read by very many people. Uh, but uh, 
by that stage, we caught the popular imagination and um, we had a very, very engaged press throughout the period on a, pub, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a sort of popular history level. And this was really important because those scholars, they didn't come for money. Those images didn't come for money. They came for Archimedes, they came for glory and, and we could give them glory. Um, the Stomachian, which only survives in the Archimedes palimpsest, from Heiberg's time, we knew that it involved the square and the square had 14 bits in it and you couldn't move these 14 bits around. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't change the proportions of these 14 bits, but no one knew what Archimedes was doing with these 14 bits in the square that could be interesting. And then Raviel pieced it all together, as it were, and he said, I know what Archimedes is doing. He's working out how many ways you can recombine the bits in that square and still make a perfect square. And you might think that there aren't many ways, but you don't know how many ways there are. And we didn't know how many ways there were because we, the, we don't have the end of the, thesis, of, the, of, the, of the treaties, Archimedes, so we don't know what the answer was. So we had to find out the answer. So we gave it to, um, we gave the puzzle to a, a MacArthur award-winning genius and combinatorist called Percy Diaconis. And we shut him in a room and said, tell us how many solutions there are. And then we gave it to a computer guy called Bill Cutler. And we said, tell us how many solutions there are. And they both came out with the same answer. And the answer is that there are um, 536 families of solutions. Uh, but altogether, there are 17,152 solutions to the and this makes it the earliest treatise in the history of in combinatorics in the history of Western mathematics, which is kind of neat. Um, let's see, it's 6.52. Can I have eight more minutes or shall I stop? I'll have eight more minutes. Keep going. I think people want to hear the end of the story. Okay, I'll try and speed it up. So if you remember, right at the beginning, I said that the Archimedes manuscript wasn't big enough for the scribe to make his prayer book. So he had to use other books as well. And it was the job, and no one had ever been able to read any of this. And it was the job of this person, Natalie Chernetska, to try and find out what was on the other non-Archimedes pages, which, you know, mostly there's a reason to palimpsest a book. It's boring, right? The amount of times that you get interesting palimpsests is tiny. But nonetheless, uh, in 2002, I got this from Natalie. In the course of further non-exploration of the non-Archimedes folios, I recently deciphered the text of an orator, um, a Greek orator unknown otherwise. I could identify parts of lost speeches by Hyperides. Now, Hyperides is not a household name now, but he was in, in antiquity. He was one of the 10 canonical orators of antiquity. And he'd never been found in a codex before. Fragments of him had bound, had, had been found in papyrus scrolls in Thebes, but this is the only Hyperides text ever to have been found in a codex. And one of these speeches is rather boring. The other speech is really interesting. You know, Hyperides and Demosthenes were good buddies, and together they decided that they should, Athens and Thebes should fight Macedon instead of giving, giving in. So they went and persuaded the Athenians and the Thebans to using their skills of oratory to fight the Macedons. And this was a really bad idea because Philip of Macedon had a son called Alexander the Great and the Athenians and the Thebans got absolutely crushed at the Battle of Chironia. And so Hyperides found himself on trial for treason. And this is the speech that he gave defending himself in the Athenian law courts from that charge of treason. Best of all, he says, is to win. But if you can't win, you should fight for a noble cause because then you'll be remembered. Consider the Spartans, he said. They've fought in inor inor an inordinate number of battles and they've won them all, but no one can remember any of them. The one battle that the Spartans thought, thought that everyone remembers is the Battle of Thermopylae where they were butchered to a man, but they fought for the freedom of Greece. It was a good speech, but he, but he didn't get let off. He got ostracized and eventually the Macedonians came up and killed him. But we have retrieved his text, which is cool. And that means that in one manuscript, in one palimpsest, there are two unique texts, one a mathematical text and one a rhetorical text. And then in 2005, dear Will 
Excellent news. The hard drive and photos came safely this week. At first glance, suggests there's no more hyperides, but several leaves of a philosophical text, on one of which I read the name Aristotle clearly enough. Clearly for Nigel Wilson isn't really clearly for the rest of us, but it's in the bottom left down there, and I've tried to make it clearer. And there it is sort of clearer still. And um, at this point, the scholarly world got very excited. And this turns out to be an otherwise unknown commentary on Aristotle's categories, possibly by Galen or by um, Alexander of Aphrodisias, or maybe Porphyry. Um, so that is three unique texts, otherwise unattested, uh, this one book. Um, this is embarrassing. So, so what you normally do when you get a medieval manuscript is you look for something called a colophon, and the colophon will tell you who, who wrote the book and where they wrote it and when they wrote it, if you like. And it took seven years to find the colophon on this book at the bottom of page one. And we found it and we read it through the particle accelerator. And you can see there the, um, uh, that there is an inscription and with hindsight, you can see it there. But now you can, now if you're, if you're a Greek scholar, you can read this. This was written by Johannes Myronas on the 14th of April, 1229. So this, the palimpsest was made in the months preceding for the 14th of April, 1229. 14th of April, 1229 was uh, in the Greek Orthodox Church, it was Easter Saturday. So this is a time for giving gifts. And so this scribe had made this book as a gift for presumably an, an, a, um, a religious institution. And we know it was Jerusalem because the prayers belong to the Jerusalem rite. Now, 14th of April, 1229 in Jerusalem was about eight weeks after Frederick II's Stupor Mundi had released Jerusalem from Muslim control. So this was not a time of great cultural flowering. This was not a time when you were gonna go out into the fields and murder a bunch of goats to make a new book. This is a time when you were going to save your soul and go to a library and reuse that which was safely in your library next door. That's what, what happened in this case. Uh, everything happened, everything, everything, I should stop now. So everyone lived happily ever after. The, 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 the leaves got conserved, they're now back with their owner. There was a publication, there was an exhibition, the data was published, it was all terrific. And um, and Archimedes is now is now saved along with his friends. Thank you very much indeed for listening, and I'm sorry to have run out of time. Oh, not at all. We all is uh, you may have I don't know if you noticed in the chat section several of our of our, our members were saying don't stop in all caps. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so well, the thing is that because I'm hopeless at technology myself even though i tell technologists what to do uh, i can't actually see the chat should i stop sharing my screen now is that what i should do you can yeah that was just the, yeah that would be great and then uh, if folks have questions put them in the q a or the chat section and uh, we've got we'll take a little bit of time now about 10 minutes for for q a um i'm i'm curious before we start asking these qu questions what um what is the owner doing with the manuscript now? Do you know? Well, so the owner is is clearly a wealthy man, and and he's a book collector, and a great book collector. And one of the things about books is that after you've collected them and you've read them, there's nothing else to do. Uh, but the owner wanted a project, and and so and this was a great book for a private owner to to undertake a project on and uh and i think he got you know a huge amount of great of great pleasure by seeing 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 the whole project unfold um and now it's in his library and it's uh kept as individual leaves mm -hmm. and um i can tell you that it is kept in better conditions than i've seen in any institution 
um, it's kept very well. And had he known when he bought it that there was this um, project? No, he made the project. I mean, I made the project. I mean, he 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 bought the book with intention of funding a project to see what was in the book and to see what could be got. But he 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 started the project. Do you know if he's left the uh, the the book to eventually? Uh, or his library in general that he if he's left it to any any institution or no i don't and i and i and i haven't asked him i don't i don't it's not sort of my business i think but i will say this that that i i have a slightly iconoclastic approach to cultural heritage i don't think that the greatest things should all be in libraries managed by Ivy League institutions. I think the important thing is that things survive and that the right people get to see them. And, and actually, I do think that having your library right next door to your seat of government is a really, really, really bad idea. Um, because they're subject to terrorist attack, for example. And the manuscripts at St. Catherine's Sinai have survived because St. Catherine's is in the middle of nowhere. The manuscripts in Constantinople didn't survive because Constantinople got privileged by the Fourth Crusade. You never know what the fate of a book is going to be. But I think that the Archimedes Palimpsest has been extremely well looked after over the last 30 years. It was extremely badly looked after for the 80 years before that. It was extremely well looked after for the 800 years before that. And we just don't know what's going to happen next. Well, Aaron's wondering um, how you were confident that submitting the manuscript to a giant surge of X-ray light wouldn't irre irreversibly damage the text. Yeah, that's a great question. So, of course, we were pretty worried about this. And uh, so we did a lot of tests. And, um, and we tested and we tested and we tested. And in truth, you know, it sounds like you're... you're this friend knows what he's talking about. So every time you expose anything to any photons, you're going to degrade it. The question is simply how much. Um, we, so the, the beam in a particle accelerator is less than the width of a human hair. It's very intense, but it's less than the width of a human hair. And the trick is to make sure that no part of the palimpsest is subject to that beam for, 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 for any more time than it has to be. So we were scanning it, right? And actually the beam was on, on any part of the palimpsest for a, for, for a tiny fraction of a, sec, of a second. And, um, and, uh, and the, and, and, we cal you, you can do a calculation as to how much you're going to degrade the thing. And we did do a calculation as to how much we were going to degrade the thing. And we decided that the, the science was there that we weren't going to degrade the thing very much uh, unless the XY stage jammed, in which case it would be like burning a cigarette hole through it. So we had to, dis we had to, we had to create enormously elaborate, elaborate mechanisms so that if the XY stays jammed, then the beam would be shut off instantaneously. And, and you know, there were any number of precautions that we had to undertake. Uh, but scientifically, we should have done a very, very small amount of damage because we know how much we exposed the manuscript to, and we couldn't see any evidence of damage. That's that's good. So uh, interesting. It's all, it feels like science fiction and <laughs> I love this is fascinating. Um, Katerina says, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. She would like to know, uh, to ask how many scribes are identified for the lower text, Archimedes, Hyperides, Aristotle's commentary. Yeah. So the Archimedes text was written all by one scribe. And, and luckily he had a rather regular hand and Reading Archimedes, I'm not saying it was easy. It turned out to be easier than the other texts because the, because the scribal hand was very regular and Archimedes actually had a rather limited vocabulary. He was a mathematician after all. 
So you didn't you didn't have a huge range of words to guess from. His language was rather formulaic. But with Greek oratory, it's much harder because your vocabulary is much wider. Um, in the end, you know, there were, there were actually there were eight manuscripts uh, altogether, and they and they were all partial. And um, the Archimedes was all one hand. The Hyperides was all one hand. The scholarly commentary, if I remember, if, if I was ever told, I can't remember. Um, we could identify the text in all of these books, in all, in all seven, except for one leaf, except for one leaf. And there is one leaf of undertext that has never been identified in the Archimedes Palimpsest. And normally you would say, well, the chances of that being interesting are tiny, uh, but this is the Archimedes Palimpsest, so we just don't know. Um, and it was just, we frankly couldn't get the technology to read this page. So the other texts are, um, I don't want to be misunderstood, they're, 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 but they're religious service books. And one day someone will bother We'll take our data, which is openly available in its raw form. We'll take our data and we'll try and read those texts. As soon as anyone wants to, they can. No one's bothered to do it yet because it's a hell of a lot of work. And the, and the scholarly gain is not as considerable as if they were unique words by Archimedes. David has wondered why there might be three different texts on the original palimpsest, two scientific and one political. Could it have been an ancient reader's digest? That is a great question. So it's a great question. Um, so here's an answer, which is for which I have no evidence. So you're in Jerusalem, it's the year 1239, Frederick II is outside, the Muslims are beating your door down, you want to save your soul. So you're in Jerusalem and somehow I don't know how, somehow you get your hands on a great library and you're Christian and you want to save your soul. It's got to be a great library because it's got to have the core text. It's going to have, it's going to have Euclid, it's going to have Demosthenes, and then it's going, to have, it's going to have Aristotle, and then it's going to have commentary on Aristotle, and then it's going to have the minor, the minor poets, right? And the difficult mathematicians. And you're going to say, you're going to say, write a book to save your soul. Which books are you going to pick to destroy? You're not going to pick your core. You're not going to pick your Euclid. You're not going to pick your Demosthenes. You're not going to pick the things that you need to be a good Christian and are in the good Christian curriculum. So you're not going to pick Euclid. You're going to pick Archimedes. And you're not going to pick Demosthenes, who's a model for your oratory. You're going to pick Hyperides, whom you barely know. And you're not going to pick your Aristotle. You're going to pick a commentary on Aristotle by some boring third-rate dude, you know. That, so that's how that's how this was taken, and I have no evidence for that at all. Well, that's a good, good deduction, though. Um, our Arthur is wondering uh, if the whole Archimedes text was read. If you're able to read the entire text, yes, depending on what you mean by red. So our job was to make images, not the best images in the world, because you could spend a huge amount of money. I mean, you know, you can spend an infinite amount of money on making photographs that get ever better. We only needed to make photographs that were so good. We only needed to make photographs that were good enough so that the scholars could read the text or guess what was there. And that's what we did. So, so the scholars could read all the text. They're not guessing. They know what's there. Can you see it? No, I can't see it. Quite often I can't see it. Quite often there are holes, um, but the scholars know what's there. So in that sense, we could read all of Archimedes, yes. Two last questions. Um, one from Susan, wondering if going back to the, the manuscript uh, and, and, and its owner, wondering if major libraries try to keep track of the locations of manuscripts that are in private hands. Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, and, and we know 
the scholarly know, world knows where, where a lot are. And great collectors often have relationships with, with curators and administrators. So the right people know where, where books are. Um, and, um, and for medieval manuscripts, the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies has a database that tracks that tracks manuscripts that, that, that show up at auction and has been tracking these manuscripts yeah, and it's gone back and look, uh, and and tracks all manuscripts and it's and it and it's got about three hundred thousand records and so we can see when manuscripts come to auction and when they come back at auction and normally we know where they go um, and and so the answer is yes most private collectors are very generous with allowing scholars to see their text the owner of the Archimedes palimpsest is a very private man but if you have a really good reason and you know what it is that you want to look at then somebody like me is going to provide an introduction and you will be able as a scholar the good research reason to see the thing that you need to see not all private collectors are like that but most are fascinating uh Lawrence with our, our last question says let's go back to the beginning why did Isidorus of Miletus select uh, to transcribe this text almost seven centuries after Archimedes' death. Okay, yes. So Isidore of Miletus is, is kind of important because Isidore of Miletus was probably the guy who copied them from scrolls into a book, which was happening around that time. And so he didn't copy the scrolls that Archimedes wrote. Uh, the scrolls that Archimedes wrote had long gone, but they'd been copied and they'd been copied. And Isidore of Miletus decided that he wanted to create a corpus of texts by Archimedes. So he tracked down where the scrolls were, some surviving scrolls, and he, and he put them together. Why did Isidore of Miletus do this? Well, one of the things about Archimedes is that although he is incredibly difficult, incredibly um, but just sort of, just sort of, just sort of difficult. He's intensely practical. It was him, after all, that does, that that helped you to approximate the value of pi. It was him, after all, who invented the the rule of the, the law of the lever. You know, uh, this is the sort of thing that Archimedes did. He was interested in in the weight of things and how to measure things. And so an awful lot of the people that are interested in and, and have helped read Archimedes are people who have a, have a deeply practical bent. And Isidore of Miletus was an architect and Hagia Sophia is built out of sphere and cylinders. And other people who are interested in Archimedes' writings are, for example, Piero della Francesca and Leonardo da Vinci. These are people that, that they've not only got brains the size of planets, but they've got a a deeply practical application that they want to do, whether it's perspective or flying machines or massive churches. Thank you. Uh, there's one question now that is uh, some of us wondering and the image behind you. Oh, the gentleman in the blue gown has some sort of he's wearing some sort of black object with a gold <laughs> like a dagger end or something handle what 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 is there. that yes no i want to know what that is too <laughs> uh and you know uh, i only noticed it earlier today and the truth is that uh that uh, the limbaugh brothers they were deeply weird people and they and they and they and they paint things that you think make perfect sense and then you realize when you look really closely at them that they don't make sense. There are bodies that don't make sense. And I'm not gonna begin to guess what that is. You might want to. And you know, some scholar probably has, and I might go and find out. If anyone wants to look up this further, it's the, it's the calendar illustration for January in the Trey Risha. I do know that in the calendar illustration for February in the Trey Risha, there are some peasants doing some rather naughty things 
rather more obviously. But I'm a bit embarrassed about that. And when I put up, so, so, so next month on the 1st of February, I'm going to put up uh, the calendar page for February, but I'm going to put up a detail that doesn't include the pudica of these pedants. <laughs> well, I, I, I think. Um...